Support for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax, audit, and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, where healthcare is changing for the better. Find out how at ahealthysc.tv. And by Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. It's an ironic cycle when topics swirl back around for new generations to address. The economy goes up, the economy goes down. Revenues and recessions dance the interconnected ballet. And the introduction and reintroduction of policies keep our workforce and leaders on their toes, looking at new innovations that will allow them to get ahead. But are some simply left to catch up? Welcome, and thank you for tuning in to the most widely watched program on Carolina business and public policy. I'm Dr. Cheryl Richards, filling in for Chris William. And on today's show, our panelists share their thoughts about the latest budget proposals, tax policies, health care plans that are changing the way individuals and employers play in life. From the students who become teachers to the children who become parents of their parents, our discussion will bring us full circle to address the issues affecting the baby boomers to the Gen Xers, Gen Ys, millennials, and now the aughts. Join us now as we begin a conversation that is sure to be at play for generations to come. Major funding also by Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. And by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. This edition of Carolina Business Review was recorded January 30th, 2014. On this week's program, Dr. Scott Beyer from Clemson University, Melinda Lawrence of the North Carolina Justice Center, and special guest, Scott Middleton, Chief Executive Officer of Agape Senior. Welcome, Scott and Melinda. Thank you for joining us for our conversation today. Nice to see you again, and great to have you on our show. It's great to be here. So we said in our opening, we've got some topics that continue to come back around again for additional discussion. Let's talk a little bit about the economic recovery. Scott, maybe you can get us started. What's, what's your thoughts on how it's, uh, recovery is looking for us now? Yeah, we had a re recent piece of news um, that just came out that uh, GDP in the fourth quarter increased by 3.2%. This is the second quarter in a row in which GDP has grown at a rate equal to its long run average or below. And importantly about that number, most of the growth came from consumption, uh, business investment, and exports, was, which were fueled by, in some sense, um, the energy sector. Um, if we continue to grow at this rate, which I expect we will over the next course of the year, we'll probably add, say, 150 to 200,000 jobs nationwide a month which kind of leads me into the South Carolina situation, is South Carolina in December of 2013, the unemployment rate dropped to 6.6%. Um, this is notable for two reasons. One, it's a t full two percentage points below where it was last year at the time. And secondly, this is the first time since 2001 that South Carolina has been below the national average. In addition, it's been broad-based in December of, uh, 2012, there were 25 counties that had unemployment rates above 10%. Now we're down to just five counties. So there seems to be some momentum in South Carolina um, for increases in employment, job creation, and especially industries that are important like construction, manufacturing, healthcare, business services have all showed uh, notable growth over the last year. So we should assume that this is good for revenues, right? So we've got people back at work, which means more revenue coming in the door. Melinda, what are your thoughts on kind of where the state budget process is going to take us in 2014 and 15? Well, I think really we should look sort of at the economy question that you just mm -hmm. asked. 
Uh, we've seen a similar fairly dramatic drop in the um, figures on unemployment that were just released. But at least in North Carolina, it looks like those numbers may be quite deceptive and that the recovery really may be stalling in North Carolina. Um, we've seen uh, a dramatic contraction of the workforce in North Carolina. We lost over 100,000 people from the workforce last year as our population grew. Um, we believe most of that is the result of workers, long-term unemployed workers, becoming so discouraged that they're no longer actively seeking work. Um, job creation in 2013 was dramatically down for North Carolina from 2012. Uh, in 2012, we cre created almost 90,000 new jobs. That number was cl closer to 60,000 in 2013. So we're actually quite concerned that uh, we're seeing a stalling rec recovery. And certainly, um, as Scott said, a very uneven recovery. Many areas in North Carolina um, are still struggling with double-digit so unemployment. Where, where's our gap with this? Because we keep hearing in the news about new companies moving to North Carolina and South Carolina and bringing new jobs, and many of them are really well-paying jobs. So where's our gap? Well, I think our gap is that the we started with such a huge jobs deficit that the new jobs that we are getting, while you know, uh, certainly helping us to fill that gap, uh, are still a long way from filling that gap. We still have one job for every three unemployed people. Scott, yeah, we're, yeah, where South Carolina is a little bit different. Um, the number, you know, the most recent employment number I looked at was we are 99.5 percent back to where we were at the, at the peak before we went into the recession. So in terms of employment, we're almost back to where we were, again, with population mm -hmm. growth, we would expect to be ahead of that. But again, South Carolina, a little mm -hmm. different than North Carolina, you look at where employment growth has been, it's construction. To me, that's a signal of you're building stuff, new businesses are coming in. Mm -hmm. The manufacturing base, again, is growing. So I think the trends in South Carolina are consistent with a, uh, a, a relatively strong economic growth for 2013. Again, probably close to the national average of about three and a half percent. And where does this disparity come in from our middle class? Because, you know, we have high wage mm -hmm. positions that we're, we see in the news often, and then we have this effort underway to increase the minimum wage. So is that going to bring us a little bit more parity? Well, although the the newspaper reports that we see are mostly about the new higher wage jobs, uh, the numbers really tell us that most of the job creation that's happening is in low-wage jobs, mm -hmm. and so the, which is why the minimum wage is so important. If the jobs that we are building are low-wage jobs, we need to make sure that those jobs can support a family. Yeah, there's been a recent push in South Carolina to uh, increase the minimum wage, um, and again, we have to think of what our what we want to target with our with our social with our policies i'm all in favor i'm very much in favor of supporting poor families the one concern i have with raising the minimum wage is it's not the most direct or efficient way to support poor families um, for example a recent study at the national level shows that an increase in the national minimum wage would only impact 11 percent of the households who are in poverty whereas 60% of the households who would benefit from minimum wage have incomes over $50,000 a year, and those workers are the second or third incomes. Again, a better support mechanism, I think, for South Carolina um, would be to have a type of er earned income tax credit, where it's tar you can, and that way you could target it at the families, you could target it at, at specific individuals, and there you are directing things to achieve objectives that you would like. You know, we could go on and on talking about our economy. We have a wonderful special guest who uh, is about to join us in a few minutes. And so I want to go ahead and um, turn now to talk a little bit about our promotion of our upcoming shows. And then I'm going to come back to the two of you and ask you to be ready to ask him what he's doing, uh, some pretty innovative things to impact the economy. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to bring in our special guest in just a moment. 
coming up next week, we're going to be talking about innovation. Um, innovation comes in many shapes and many forms. So who's investing in research and development in the Carolinas? We have a panel of experts, and they're going to weigh in on that topic. And then in two weeks, North Carolina's Attorney General will be here, and we're going to talk with Roy Cooper about defending the state in the wake of potential identity fraud tied to mistakes at the Department of Health and Human Services. Stay tuned for that. And then in a few weeks, we're going to end up having some business leaders and education uh, experts here on our show. So you'll want to stay tuned for that, Walter McDowell and, and his efforts here at the state of North Carolina. But now we're joined by our special guest, and our special guest today is at the forefront of preparing for a significant change in our region's demographics. As baby boomers become unable to care for themselves, their families are searching for solutions, and that doesn't necessarily mean a nursing home. Columbia-based Agape Senior has grown under this man's leadership. Please welcome Agape Senior's founder and CEO, Scott Middleton. It's good to be here. Scott, welcome. <laughs> Thank you for joining our show today. So we were talking before we came on air. Uh, you had an interesting entree into this profession about 20 years ago. Uh, what made you choose this path of healthcare administration of sorts? Well, I was uh, a United Methodist minister for 10 years in South Carolina and served churches all over the state and uh, really have a, have a passion for what I saw uh, happening to the seniors in our state as I, as I went in and out of nursing homes doing my pastoral work, but also just in, in and out of people's homes where many times they were left very isolated and alone and really not cared for. And so I, I had a vision uh, 30 years ago to do something about it, and it took me 10 years in, in pastoral ministry to finally say it was time to do it. So I, I uh, went back to school, got a master's in healthcare administration, and, and plugged on to try to change uh, the way care is being provided to seniors in our state. So I think it's safe to say you found the marriage of um, purpose and passion in what you're doing now. Absolutely, and certainly in ministry. That's Fantastic. Right. Well, I, I don't want to take any time from our uh, two panelists here to have some questions for you, but I want to open the, the table. You've got a pretty unique apprenticeship program that you uh, do now. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? I think we might have some questions to explore. Well, it was interesting to hear them talk a little bit about um, the minimum wage, and and to me, the the really the, the, the way to help people improve their lives is through education. And we we know that the, the more education that people have, the more they're going to be able to be productive and the more money they'll be able to make. And, and so our goal at, at Agape Senior is always to be, make sure that we have the most educated workforce uh, in, in health care in our state. And so um, I, I brought on as our Chief Human Capital Officer a few years ago, Dr. Jimmy Williamson, who had been a president of two technical colleges in South Carolina. And I said, Jimmy, I want you to help us grow the educational program. And we started um, a, a program called Agape uh, Agape University and we wanted to make sure that all of our employees had the chance to keep on learning and one of the first things he brought to us was an apprenticeship program and we actually created the first health care apprenticeship program in the state of South Carolina and we did that for certified nursing assistants and they they would go through um, th they go through a program it's a one-year program they meet once a week and it's a two-hour uh, in-class um, uh, lessons that they have and then they have homework assignments they did this on their own time. They weren't being paid for their time, but we uh, we built into the program a wage progression. So if they stayed in the program for three months, they get 25 cents an hour more for each month, each quarter that they stayed in. So at the end of the year, they got a $2,000 raise. Um, the state of South Carolina actually pays a $1,000 tax credit uh, to an employer who provides a program like this. So we weren't getting all of our money back, but we were certainly getting some. What, what we found happened is exactly what we thought was retention. The, the, the nursing assistants that went through this program, at the end of the first year, we had a 92 percent retention rate. Now, a lot of you may say, well, that's not really that great or that's, that's okay, but in skilled nursing homes and, and in, uh, for certified nursing assistants, the, uh, the average turnover rate is somewhere between 80 and 100 percent. And so for us to have um, a 92 percent retention rate, at the end of the second year with that same cohort, we were at 87 percent. And so it really has been a successful program. So we expanded the apprenticeship program, not just to those certified nursing assistants, but we've created management apprenticeship programs. So we have, um, for example, anybody who comes in our company that's going to be a manager, nurses, uh, uh, physical, occupational therapists who want to move into a management role, we found they, they don't have the education base to really 
really be managers. They know exactly what to do clinically, so we wanted to give them chances. So we created apprenticeship programs for our managers, and so they go through a, a, a two-year program uh, through this apprenticeship program, and they meet monthly, um, and, and then they have assignments in between. We've now um, expanded our university to do a lot of online courses, so we have computers set up in all of our entities and buildings, and, and our, our, uh, our employees can go sit down, and we have 1,200 online classes that have been developed um, by our own employees, so they are getting very specific uh, Agape senior information. Wow, so you've mm -hmm. essentially created an in-house internal professional development department. A absolutely. Um, and we've been working with a lot of colleges and universities to do that. In fact, the CNA apprenticeship program the first year was taught um, solely by professors at, um, at a couple of the technical colleges as well as the university. But our real goal was that we wanted to be able to teach in-house because we want our employees not only just to be uh, people who can learn, but, but you learn a lot by teaching. And so uh, we transitioned to those programs so they're actually being taught by our employees. And occasionally we'll have a new program that we're going to roll out and we'll actually hire somebody from the colleges or universities to help us uh, to do that. As a university uh, perspective, you <laughs> must have a number of questions that are going through your head. Uh, I'm going to keep on, on subject here. It's one of the things that I find interesting is that in this, in this era of businesses are outsourcing parts of, their, of what they do, whether it be food services or janitorial services or training, it seems you are doing more in-house. You touched on that a little bit. What, what is it? Is it something about the service that you provide? Is it, is it something about your business model? Why are, why are you bucking the trend of outsourcing and doing more in-house? Well, um, it, it's really all about integration with healthcare, and, and we take care of seniors. Our average age of, of the person we take care of is about 82 to 85 years old. And, and what we found is it's the coordination of all the services that really put together the best healthcare for them. So for example, somebody may come into our system through our skilled nursing and rehab center. They may have fallen and broken a hip and had to come in for short-term rehab, and, and then at that point, Point, they may be transitioning out either back home or to assisted living and we want to make sure that 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 care um, transcends everywhere they may go and we found that uh, one of the the key components of that was physician services and it's very difficult in most areas to find physicians who will come out to your nursing home or assisted living and really be committed to coming you know they may contract with you and say yeah I'll show up but they they may say I'm you I'll be there on Tuesday and but they may not get there to Wednesday and and we weren't able to get the really kind of services that we needed. So we started our physicians practice and now in our skilled facilities we have do, uh, physicians, nurse practitioners and doctors in all of our skilled nursing homes at least five and sometimes seven days a week. In our assisted livings we um, we try to have them in there at least three days a week. Interesting to statistic that we've discovered in-house is that um, when, when we had a physician only coming out once a week uh, to our facilities, we were finding about a 10% hospitalization rate for our patients on a monthly basis, meaning about 10% of our elderly, and remember they're 82 to 85, so there is a lot of hospitalization, they were going about 10, at, at a rate of about 10%. When we started bringing in our practitioners three times a week um, so that they had the opportunity, it doesn't mean that everybody's seeing the doctor three times a week, but at least they have the opportunity they're sick, we saw that number go down to 2.5%. So we've saw, seen a, a great reduction in hospitalizations, emergency room visits, because we had those physicians on hand. And we just weren't able to get that from outsourcing that. Um, same thing with, with hospice services, um, it, um, it therapy services. Uh, we just couldn't get the commitment of healthcare providers to always able to give us exactly what we needed when we needed it. And so we did vertical integration, you know, which is something I learned at, at USC when I was working on my master's program. Yeah. Uh, so I was really delighted to hear about your apprenticeship program because I think it's a great model um, that we in North Carolina could look to. Um, and with the, with the baby boomers moving in uh, to our health care system, we're obviously going to need many more qualified health care professionals than we currently have. And it seems like you found a model that may really help with that 
with that training. A absolutely. Um, one of the things, is, as I said, you know, our, aver our average age is somewhere between 82 and 85 mm -hmm. for the patients that we see. And so our baby boomers are just now turning 65. Mm -hmm. um, but we are dealing with a lot of baby boomers who are bringing in their parents mm -hmm. and looking for placement for them. And what we're finding is that uh, the generation before the baby boomers, for the most part, were pretty good savers. And they, and they have money. What I'm sc scared about is the baby boomers they come in and, and they still are making mortgage payments. You know, they have no idea that they would ever pay off a house because they'll just turn around and refinance it in a few years. So I'm really concerned about cost. A lot of my colleagues have thought, well, the baby boomers are coming along. They got a lot of money. We need to be building very high end, you know, resort style um, type facilities. Uh, but I think we may be overbuilding the market a little bit because when they get there, are they going to have the money? Um, but there's going to be a lot of them. So we've got to learn to be much more efficient and we also have to be able to, to learn to use all the resources available. And that's why I think it's so important to, to uh, when you take a look at, for example, in-house therapy, you know, providing that therapy inside of an assisted living facility where those therapists are there daily to take care of whatever patients need. What we found is that those patients um, live longer, they live with, with less needs that we have to provide for them. Uh, so it, it's really making sure they have the physician care, the therapy care, even home hospice. I always like to tell folks, you know, the statistic is people who go on hospice live 29 days longer than those who don't with the same diagnosis. Mm. Wow. Now why is that? Because hospice is coming in and providing additional care and services for that person, but also because that person at that point in time has chosen to, uh, to, to not seek more aggressive mm -hmm. treatments that a lot of times actually bring on an earlier death rather than a later death. Let me make a kind of transitional question because you talk about resources and obviously a lot of topic around the Affordable Care Act right now. Um, you know, what's your perception of, has that been a catalyst for reform that everyone thought it was going to be? You know, what are the impacts that you see, you know, in Medicaid, uh, Medicare? Take us there. Well, well, that's really interesting because um, uh, with the Affordable Care Act, so many people think it's just about the, the health insurance and, and everybody's thinking about what's happening in the last few months with trying to ev get everybody insured. But for us, the Affordable Care Act happened three years ago. Um, the Affordable Care Act started with new mandates, new requirements, and new funding that was available to help the health care industry start to transition. For example, um, we, we were able to receive grants from, from the government to help pay for new electronic medical record systems. Um, and those systems are so important and vital into our health care. And I, I'm, I'm really excited about this because we've just created this absolutely wonderful model uh, in, in our facilities. We have um, all of our physicians uh, use, uh, use a software that can be used on their iPhone, their iPad, or, uh, or a laptop, just depending on what the physician generally likes to use. Uh, they have dictation or uh, where they can dictate right into the system and it can start typing everything from their dictation to put in. But the great part of it is it, it integrates to our pharmacy. And one of the reasons we have our own pharmacy is we wanted to make sure all that did integrate. So the doctor walks into the nursing center and, and he or she writes down a prescription, puts it in electronically into the iPad, sends it to the pharmacy where the pharmacy will then review the medication, but they don't have to retype it in, which is a lot of times where errors would occur because you might not be able to read the doctor's handwriting or there was some... You were, you were distracted and you put the wrong thing in. So now the pharmacist just looks at it, reviews it, checks to see if there's any going to be any complications, and then sends it on actually now to our nursing homes to our automated dispensing machines. We have just started this in South Carolina. We're still under our trial program through the Board of Pharmacy. But now that, that it goes right to a dispensing machine. So the doctor can write the order at 4.30 and at 5 o'clock, the nurse goes to get the medicine out of the machine and the, the right medicine comes out. Um, before, and still in most traditional settings, um, the pharmacy has to, to package it, they have to put it on a, uh, in, in a cart, they have to send it by transport all over the state for somebody to get, and it may mean that that person doesn't get their medication and they don't start it until the following day or sometimes two days later. Mm -hmm. So that the Affordable Care Act is what, what's kind of stimulated all of this because they're really pushing for that electronic medical record, but also 
also the integration of how services work. You know, Affordable Care Act is the is what's responsible for hospitals getting penalized if they have readmissions to the hospital within 30 days. Nursing homes will go under that umbrella, we think, in, 2000, in 2015. So now we have a program called Transitional Care Management, where we are following our, our patients for 30 days after discharge from hospital or nursing home with, with a, an individual who calls them, talks to them, they come in back in for physician visits so that we can keep them from being rehospitalized. And that's where we're going to start saving Medicare dollars. So wow, that is truly remarkable. We've got about 30 <laughs> seconds left in the program, so I'm not even sure we'll get another question in there. Fascinating work um, that you're doing and, and certainly changing the landscape of the local community, um, uh, bringing in the innovation of thought and technology um, along with policy. So really remarkable in many ways. Thank you, thank Scott. You. Thank you, Melinda. Thank you, Scott, as well for joining us today. It's been a lovely conversation. We've enjoyed it. Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. Grant Thornton, operating in more than 100 countries, our tax audit and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care, when and where you need it. Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services, with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, where healthcare is changing for the better. Find out how at ahealthysc.tv and by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.com.